My name is Lester Singer. I'm the chairman of the Division of Social Sciences at the New School. And it's my pleasant job to introduce Dr. Marcuse. Now, fortunately, all of you have heard of Dr. Marcuse and require very little in the way of introduction. And furthermore, our time is limited, so that I will only take a few moments. We're going to be privileged tonight to hear remarks from a man who spans many kinds of gaps, who bridges many kinds of differences. Philosophically, he reaches from the 19th century into, I think it's safe to predict, the 21st century. He bridges many disciplines, psychology, philosophy, sociology, economics, political science. There are no boundaries to this man. And this man has not only the intellectual courage to look critically at the setting in which we live, he also has the guts to offer prescriptions. And this, I think, is a tremendous contribution. I'm sure that you haven't come to hear me speak, but rather to hear Dr. Marcuse speak. I just wanted to give you a view of the way I see him. And now, Dr. Herbert Marcuse. I don't know whether I can handle all these things here. I'm not, I hate talking into the mic rather than to you. So please, if you don't hear me, shout. I would like to uh, give you a survey of the three lectures. In the first tonight, I will try to discuss with you the situation of our society with respect to radical change. And by radical change, I do not mean changes within the society, but change of the society as a whole and its replacement by another form of society. I will furthermore outline very briefly the prospects of the radical opposition and especially try to answer in a preliminary way the question, are there any tendencies, objective tendencies, affecting the very structure of our society that may lead to its disintegration and therefore provide the soil for the activity, present and future, mostly future, of the opposition. Uh, in the second lecture, I will try uh, to discuss uh, what I call the new depth dimension of the opposition, namely the new sensibility, not only new consciousness, but new sensibility, the new type of man and woman uh, which I see emerging, and uh, correspondingly the uh, demand for a new relationship between man and nature and between man and man involved in this opposition. And in the last and third of these lectures, I will deal mainly with the role of the arts, literature, music, to a very minor degree painting, in the development of a radical opposition today. Now, I would like to start by recalling some brute facts. Brute facts uh, which have become so familiar today that they are hardly noticed anymore, but should remain the uh, foundation on which to discuss. That is the fact of the availability of all resources, natural, technical, scientific, that would enable man to abolish scarcity, 
the world over. That means, in face of these resources available to man, the time-honored argument of scarcity, that it is unconquered scarcity which prevents the establishment of a decent society, this argument is becoming entirely irrational. The terrible scarcity still existing in large parts of the world is maintained neither by nature nor because it is in the nature of society to maintain it. It is maintained by the policies, domestic and foreign, of the established society. Now, in contrast with the availability of all these resources and with the possibility of constructing a decent, free society for all, we see that this possibility is prevented today with all available means. It is prevented in the West by the capitalist system itself because the construction of a free and decent human society could not possibly take place within the framework of the established capitalist system. And it is prevented in the East by the competitive coexistence of capitalism and socialism, which uh, has forced the socialist countries or communist countries from the beginning to build up its strategic and technical and military potential at the expense of redirecting technical progress in the direction of integral socialism. Now, this is in the most general traits, the status quo. And against this great status quo, the tendencies and forces which seem to make for a disintegration of the status quo. I at this place enumerate them only very briefly. It is first of all in the metropoles, the rebellion of the radical youth, and the opposition, radical opposition, of the racial and national minorities. Secondly, the national liberation movements in the third world, which has long since become part of the so-called living space of capitalism. It is thirdly, the growing economic instability, which now seems to affect the very foundations of the system. And it is lastly, the basic, and I say basic, contradiction between capitalism and communism, basic because at the present stage, as you see, there is far going cooperation, if not collusion, between the two systems, the Soviet orbit on the one side and the capitalist on the other. Now the question, and obviously highly a speculative question, which I would like uh, to raise now is assuming that these conflicts which I have just outlined, assuming that they explode, assuming that they are no longer manageable within the framework of the established system, what is at stake? Or what is at stake if there really should be a 20th century or 21st century revolution. I think the first we can say is that this revolution would be the first truly world historical revolution. It could under no circumstances be confined to one country. If it breaks out in the most advanced industrial country in the United States, it would mean the collapse 
of the lucky regimes which live only by support of the United States in the third world and would thus make room for native, genuine, radical governments finally introducing the long-needed reform. Secondly, this revolution would make possible the independent development of the Cuban and Chinese revolution, which now both suffer from the international competitive coexistence. And thirdly, it is hard to see how such a revolution could be without influence in the Soviet orbit itself. It is most likely that it would lead to a political upheaval in this orbit. Moreover, this entirely hypothetic 20th or 21st century revolution would be qualitatively different from all preceding historical revolutions, inasmuch as it is based on the achievements of industrial society and on the very realistic prospect of finally abolishing man's subordination to the instruments of his labor, that is to say, a revolution which could finally introduce the progressive reduction of alienated labor and could terminate in a total cultural revolution, in one word, integral socialism. Now, the unprecedented scope and depth of this prospective revolution has led the established societies to what I would call already today a preventive counter-revolution. I believe that we have entered the period of the preventive counter-revolution, that is to say a counter-revolution without a preceding revolution, a counter-revolution designed to prevent the outbreak of such a revolution, and this counter-revolution is manifest here by intensified repression at home and continued aggression abroad, by the streamlined organization of the established machinery of government, and this repressive mobilization of the established society is supported by the continued integration, apathy, hostility against radical change on the part of the majority of the population. The so-called silent majority, which in fact is not silent at all, but perhaps the most vociferous majority in history, and a majority which is in its very nature self-perpetuating as conservative majority. I would like to add right here that this conservatism, this hostility to radical change, is a perfectly rational reaction, perfectly rational, because this majority is only too understandably unwilling to sacrifice even the precarious and relative comforts and security they have now for the risk of a total revolution. This conservative majority furnishes the continued support of the established society and, as against it, we find among the radical opposition, divisiveness, confusion, defeatism, and isolation from the masses. This is why I suggested to call 
for the beginning and for the beginning only, this hypothetical revolution, the impossible revolution. Impossible because it seems to have no much, no mass base. It does not seem to express a vital need among the majority of the population. It takes place or would take place in the face of the unimpaired strength and effectiveness of the state machinery. And it would take place at a relatively high level of the standard of living. In other words, none of the classical preconditions for a revolution seem to prevail. And yet, at the same time, this impossible revolution is, in my view, the most necessary of all revolutions, unless our civilization should terminate in a perfect barbarization of humanity. Impossible and necessary revolution. Or, in more technical terms, the subjective conditions for a revolution seem to be absent, whereas the objective conditions prevail. The subjective conditions absent, namely a lacking consciousness of the incurable because inherent conditions of the status quo and of the possibilities for changing the status quo. Now, these subjective factors have themselves become a very material force. As I just mentioned, this lack of consciousness is generated by the system itself, especially by the prevalence of relative prosperity and a high standard of living, and it thus becomes in itself a factor of social cohesion. The conflicts, the misery, the aggressiveness of the existing conditions are hidden behind the technological veil. The system still delivers goods, delivers them rapidly and at an ever enlarging scale, and in the face of this overwhelming power and rationality, the opposition seems to be powerless. Now, the first question I want to try to answer today is, are there any tendencies that might close the gap between the subjective and the objective factors, between consciousness and reality, and thus make the impossible revolution a possible and perhaps even probable revolution. I believe that such tendencies become identifiable if we stop looking for the famous revolutionary subject as if it were a thing, a mass which is there or which is not there. These tendencies are identifiable if we remember that the revolutionary subject can become such only in the process of change itself, and if we demystify the concept of class and take account of the fact that even the structure of a class changes with basic changes in the productive process itself. This means that concepts elaborated in the analysis of 19th century and early century capitalism cannot simply be applied in the analysis of present-day monopolistic state capitalism. 
This necessary re-examination of concepts holds also true for the dialectical concepts, provided only that the new concept is not simply the ex post adjustment of the original concept, but is the result of the internal development of the original concept in line with the development of society itself. Now let me try to give a sketch of the social development that in my view compels us to re-examine the basic concepts. To the degree to which the international concentration of economic power progresses and individual capitalist enterprises are increasingly subjected to the interest of capital as a whole, to that degree is capital ever more directly fused with the state. We have the dependence of capital on the political and military power structure, and not only as it is so often maintained the other way around namely the dependence of the political and military power structure on capital. Domestic and foreign policy are becoming every closer interrelated. Economic and political controls now extend to all spheres and groups of society. In other words, we have a centralization of dependence and in economic terms, ever more strata of the middle classes become dependent on monopoly capital and are themselves producing surplus value. Or exploitation in the Marxian sense is universalized beyond the specific class of industrial and agricultural labor. The most familiar trend indicating this development is of course the increasing proportion of white-collar workers, intelligentsia, in the process of material production itself. The emergence <coughs> of the so-called new working class or educated labor necessitated by the increasingly technological and scientific character of the production process itself. But not only is exploitation universalized, it also changes its character. It draws and drains mental rather than physical energy is human rather than material depravation and it proceeds under a high standard of living. Result of these tendencies, the creation of a vast dependent underlying population separated from any control over the means of production while spending their life in alienated work, but not a proletariat in the classical Marxian sense, not in its majority living in misery and abject poverty like the former, in many segments rather bourgeois in its outlook, values and aspirations, and still very different from the ever smaller ruling for a circles of the bourgeoisie. It can easily be said that Marx never defined the proletariat in terms of its consciousness, but in terms of its situation in the productive process. Apart from the fact that even that situation has changed, 
with a diminishing proportion of blue collar worker compared with white collar workers. It is absolutely impermissible to overlook changes in the consciousness, especially not for those who want still to be called Marxists, since it was Marx and Engels themselves who said that the consciousness of the exploited class is one of the strongest productive factors. Now, underneath this dependent population, which is not a proletariat, the large number of the so-called underprivileged, a euphemism if there ever was one, racial and national minorities, technologically unemployed and unemployable, but at the margin of the regular working class which reproduces the capitalist society. This is a new techno-structure of exploitation. Growing productivity of labor, constantly augmenting the wealth of commodities and services, intensified meaningless work and performances required only for producing and buying the goods and services which were offered, scientific control of consciousness and instincts of man, in short, domination through steered satisfaction and steered aggression. And the human base of this power structure, no longer only one specific class of industrial labor, but the vast majority of the dependent population, which is the object and at the same time which reproduces this structure. Consequently, we have mass consciousness rather than class consciousness, the economic struggle and competition rather than the political class struggle. Men are continually deprived of the fruit of their labor by the necessity to submit to exploitation in order to be able to buy the steadily multiplying merchandises services and status symbols. The consumer society, the so-called consumer society is a misnomer because it is nothing but the new form in which the capitalist mode of production is reproduced. Now is it conceivable at all that this dependent and controlled mass becomes the human base of radical change, that it becomes politically conscious and active, is there any such prospect? Only in a process of radicalization can the actual subject of change emerge from within this mass. And inasmuch as the subject must be capable of changing the very foundations of society and redirect its mode of production, this subject would still be the working class, but a working class restructured to include the technical and functional intelligentsia and a living class living way above the level of poverty. This is a new constellation as far as the subject of change is concerned. But if this is the case, we are confronted with a paradox. Namely, under these circumstances, radicalization, radical change, revolution would not be generated primarily by poverty and material want, but by apparently or really 
non-material needs. And that means the change in the economic and political institutions would be spearheaded, sparked by a non-material, moral, cultural revolution. I believe that this statement today is already a hindsight. However, the cultural revolution, which is indeed going on before our eyes, can fulfill this historical function, namely to spark radical change, only if and when the conservative majority no longer perpetuates itself, only if and when the effective integration of the majority of the population has taken place. And this means if and when the basic economic and political process begins to be disintegrating and to transform the potential into the actual the economic into the political struggle, thus joining the subjective and objective conditions. And we have to ask now, does the dynamic of capitalism today make for such a transformation? The brief prevailing analysis suggested that the revolution appears as impossible only if envisaged after the model of previous historical revolutions. It appears as quite possible if envisaged within the dynamic of contemporary capitalism as a result of the achievements of capitalism. Or while the basic internal contradictions continue to operate and extend their scope and impact in the international arena, they now assume new forms. Developments which traditionally were minimized as pertaining only to the superstructure of society now affect the very basis of the society, the process of production itself. The consumer society, the result of the very growth of capitalism, threatens to impede the reproduction of capitalism in and by its human base. The blatant contrast between the realistic possibilities of human freedom on the one side and their systematic methodical restriction and suppression on the other, this contrast is ever harder to manage, ever harder to manipulate, ever harder to rationalize, since it is constantly widened by the capitalist mode of production itself. Under these circumstances, we can expect, in fact, I suggest we are already witnessing the gradual dysfunctioning, malfunctioning of those operational values which are essential to the reproduction of the social system. The loosening of the moral fiber of cohesion, the weakening of work discipline, responsibility, efficiency, the denial of that famous inner worldly asceticism, which indeed was at the very roots of capitalism, the Keynesian revolution with a vengeance, spending rather than saving, which indeed contradicts the very model of classical capitalism, then all sorts of dropouts, withdrawals, dissociation, not only among the rebellious middle class youth, but also among GIs, among young workers, 
even among executives and junior executives. In short, a still largely unpolitical, diffuse, non-directed and yet profound non-identification with the system. This, I suggest, is the reverse, is the soil beneath the noisy, hysterical, well-propagandized identification with the system by the majority, a ground still shifting, still weak, but bound to get larger and stronger because, and I come back again and again to this point, this rebellion against the behavior patterns required for the capitalist system is not only generated by the system, but also necessitated and constantly promoted by the system as essential for the continued and enlarged realization of capital. How? At the present stage, capitalism creates, alongside the world of alienated labor, <coughs> misery and repression, which it sustains, a world of ease, comfort, gadgets, enjoyment, even luxury, in which increasing numbers of the people participate, though largely precariously and vicariously, on television, in short holidays, vacations, and so on. And this world, this other very real world, undermines the faith in the necessity, in the continued necessity, of alienated labor, of making one's life as a mere means for earning a living. More and more people realize that their performances are in any rational sense unnecessary, that they can live and could live on the basis of what is available to the society in a very different way. This is economically expressed in the growth of unproductive over productive labor. Productive labor here meaning in the classical sense, labor that really produces saleable commodities. It is expressed in the near saturation of the investment and commodity market and in the constantly diminishing quantity of alienated work necessary to reproduce society on the established and even higher cultural level. I would like to read you a description of the consumer society with respect to the aspects I have just stressed. It was published in uh, Le Monde in, on June 2nd, 1970, and I think it is on the very sh in a very short space the best one. I quote, The development of the third sector, that of services, henceforth takes place at an accelerated rhythm. It absorbs growing demand and calls for ever-increasing unproductive investments. The growth of this sector creates a disequilibrium in the balance of forces, forces which up to now have entirely turned on the multiplication of goods and on the profitability of production. It is not a paradox if the producer begins to recede more and more before the consumer, if the will to produce weakens before the impatience of a consumption for which the acquisition of things produced is less important than the enjoyment of things living. The result of the revolt of the young, of the young generations against the consumer society 
This revolt is nothing else than an intellectual manifestation of the will to go beyond the industrial era, the search for a new profile of society which is placed beyond a society of producers." End quote. In other words, the capitalist mode of production itself undermines in a new historical form the performance principle on which this mode of production depends. The consumer society, the grave digger of capitalism. This would indeed be a new form of capitalist development. Now to be sure, what I have just tried to explain, much of this is just psychology, just moral ideological, and what can be more un-Marxist than this emphasis on non-material factors? Well, I would suggest that just as in the work process of society, mental factors increasingly prevail over physical and material ones, so they do in the behavior and actions of the individuals and social groups in their function of shaping this society. On both levels, in the productive process itself and in the social morality responding to this process, the same general tendency expresses itself, namely the degree to which Capitalism has technically mastered the problem of material satisfaction so that non-material issues, aspirations and values such as the free development of human faculties, the satisfaction of the creative, aesthetic and erotic needs of man, the emancipation of the senses, to quote the early Marx, they become on a social scale driving forces of social change. Therefore, indeed the need for a corresponding development in theory, the internal transformation of dialectical materialism into, into what? Well, we have not yet a word for it, and I would by no means be ashamed to say socialist idealism. In this sense, the highest achievement of capitalism, the consumer society, saps the roots of capitalism in the individuals. They rebel against the performance principle. They rebel against the competition for meaningless jobs. They rebel against increasingly unnecessary repression and renunciation. To be sure, among the majority, this rebellion is still an inarticulate individual rebellion accompanied by frustration, hatred and resentment. It is articulate and spreading with political goals among the militant youth and among the oppressed racial and national minorities. And in the face of this growing threat, the establishment answers with increased violence and increased co-option. We all know the co-option we know to, the, de uh, to the, uh, the degree to which the movement is already co-opted, but we have to ask the question, is that perhaps co-option with a vengeance? In any case, in this co-option, values and aspirations and goals break into the one-dimensional society, still blunted, largely repressed, inarticulate, but still aspirations and goals 
which are becoming increasingly incompatible with the smooth functioning of the system. Defamed and ridiculed as merely negative and destructive, these new values and goals are as such positive. What are they? Well, a society without war, without institutionalized violence, without cruelty, without brutality, without exploitation. Certainly negative in their formulation, but in their content I would venture to submit the most positive goals you can possibly formulate today. In the last analysis, these goals would make for a radical social change which would transcend in its scope and motives its historical precursors. That is to say, a change which would bring about not only new institutions, not only a new mode of production, but equally important, a new type of human being, new forms of life, a new consciousness and a new sensibility, incapable of tolerating any longer, incapable of physically tolerating any longer, exploitation, ignorance and brutality, and willing to build a world in accord with this praiseworthy inability. I will conclude by giving my impression of the prospects of this opposition today. I believe that precisely because of the unprecedented scope and depth of the goals, of the unprecedented aspects and dimensions of the human existence that are mobilized here, mind and body, consciousness and unconsciousness, precisely because of this, the opposition is indeed a danger, already a danger, to the established society. And, as I suggested at the beginning, the answer is already given, the preventive counter-revolution. Today, under the incipient counter-revolution, it is a question of survival for the opposition, and this means self-imposed discipline, self-imposed distinction between actions that can serve the goals and actions that are bound to defeat them. Things are getting serious under the counter-revolution. The movement, I believe, has reached the level of history. The work of dissent, the work of relearning and re-educating must go on against overwhelming odds. It is the only hope that the catastrophe can still be prevented. And by catastrophe, I do mean not so much nuclear war. I think it is perfectly possible, even probable, that the two superpowers come to an agreement not to use nuclear weapons in their own interest. The catastrophe would rather be after a period of prolonged violence and destruction, the destruction of humanity itself in a totally robotized, plastic, scientifically controlled barbarism, compared with which Orwell's 1984 already today 
appears as a paradisical society. There is absolutely no necessity that this must happen. There are no such inexorable laws in history. It is still up to our will, to your will and intelligence to prevent the catastrophe. I do hope you can do it and you should have over and above and through all ideological differences and divisions, the constant and full support of anyone who is still interested in remaining a human being or rather in finally, con finally beginning to live like a human being. Thank you.